Just last month, a guy by the name of Ty Trin from Calgary became one of Canada's newest multi-millionaires by winning a lottery jackpot of $65 million. Now that's tied with the largest win ever in the history of Canada. And upon finding out that he won, he kind of kept it a secret from his family and friends until recently. And then the media asked him, what are you gonna do with your earnings, with your winnings? And he says, I've got no plans to do anything with the money. I'm just gonna put it in the bank for now. And I'm like, okay, stop right there, right? Like, who wins 65 mil and goes, hmm, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Because if you're like me, immediately your thoughts go to how this money can benefit you, like yourself. For me, it's my family, my mortgage, my dream trips, my sweet new ride, my upgrades that I want to get. It's all about me, me, and me. It's funny how we so automatically think of ourselves before others, how it's typically always about us first. And it's probably, I think, because a lot of us deal with the pressure, with the anxiety over money and stuff. I mean, just two weeks ago, the Financial Post stated that more than half of Canadians live paycheck to paycheck. And you top that off with one third of Canadians that have no retirement savings, you get what a lot of people are facing, right? Uh, Pressure, tension, worry. The Post conducted a survey which reported 57% of Canadians are carrying credit card debt. And we all know that's the worst debt to carry because of the high interest rates. And out of those 57%, 40% owe more than $20,000 on those credit cards. Now that's a crisis, that's a spending issue, that's a saving issue, that's an entitlement issue, and it's also a survival issue. And so with that type of pressure, the concept of generosity seems a little bit countercultural. It seems a little bit unintuitive, it's irrational that for a lot of people it just becomes, well I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not really in a position to do this. Or one day I will, but I have to deal with what's in front of me now. Dave Ramsey said, the habits you create when you have little money are the habits you live out when you have lots of money. And so the concept of generosity isn't necessarily dependent upon the amount of money in your bank account as it is dependent upon the amount of willingness in your heart. And so as the stats illustrate, odds are that some of you here and watching online are dealing with some very real money tensions and issues in your life right now. And our goal for you at Hope City is that you experience God's fullness in every area of your life, including finances. And so I just want to let you know, this coming January, we're offering what's called Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University in two locations. It's going to be one here at the Millwoods campus, and we're also going to be doing a course at the Terwilliger Rec Center. And if this interests you, after the service here or to Williger, you can go to the info booth. You can get some details of the event. Or if you're watching online or prefer to go online, you can go to hopecity.ca slash money and find out all the details there. Now, generosity is a learned trait over time. And I'm really happy to say that this is embedded into who we are as a church. I mean, we support a lot of things around here. In this past year alone, we gave away $1.1 million to missions and outreach, both locally and globally. And church, that's the highest we have ever done. Yeah, I I say, way to go. It's awesome. You know, included in that amount was the above and beyond commitments that we wanted to do in what we call around here our Hope Fund. It's kind of going the extra mile. And we did stuff like providing money for a new roof for Adira, which is a, a local women's addiction and recovery center. We gave 110 grand there. We gave 30 grand to plant the church in Burundi, Africa. We gave four grand worth of sports equipment to Shiloh Youth Rants. We get generosity as a church, and I'm thankful for that. Yes, it's a little irrational but it's how God calls us to live. Now, the word irrational means not logical or reasonable. It's baseless. It's unfounded, even unjustifiable. Now, I'm curious. Have you ever done something irrational? 
Like the moment you do it, you're kind of snickering, right? Because we all have. The moment you do it, you're like, oh man, what was I thinking? Now, I got a whole list of that in my life. Some which include going off a cliff on a snowboard and landing in a tree, or going for a uh, flip on a wakeboard and almost paralyzing myself, or falling asleep behind the wheel of a car, and even the girl I dated in high school, like, what was I thinking, right? (laughs) Like most times, the word irrational is associated with negative experiences. But what about turning it into something positive? We could live with irrational kindness, irrational love, irrational support, irrational generosity. And winning $65 million isn't the solution to this kind of living. It's kind of why we read in the Old Testament of the Bible, Proverbs, it's a wisdom book, these words. Trust in your money and down you go, but the godly flourish like leaves in spring. Jesus said it this way. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I want you for a moment to listen to some uncomprehensible figures. The U.S. debt load is currently around $22 trillion. The Canadian debt load is around 2.16 trillion, and this has increased just over the last three years a lot. Alberta's debt load is forecasted to be around 71 billion. So debt is how nations function, and so it becomes this trickle-down effect into the lives of the people who live in those nations. And then what we can see is that the concept of generosity almost gets forgotten in this kind of economic climate. It becomes just look out for yourself, and that is it. Now, the Bible has a lot to say. It has a lot of wisdom when it comes to money. And just so you know, we go to the Bible each week at Hope City for a couple of reasons. One, we believe that the Bible is a great blueprint on how to do life. And secondly, around here, we believe that following Jesus is the best decision anyone can make. And because the Bible tells us a lot about who Jesus is, it just makes sense to go there. And in the stories that Jesus told, two-thirds of them deal with the topic of finances and possessions. In the first four books of the New Testament, which are called the Gospels, one in ten verses deal directly with money. In all of Scripture, there's over 2,300 verses that talk about money. And, and, And you know what? That's five times as many that talk about faith, five times as many that talk about prayer. So this is a really big deal to God. Proverbs 22, 7 says this, the borrower is slave to the lender. And what we hear in those words is that, hey man, there's no freedom in debt, right? But there is a better way to do life. Paul, a follower of Jesus, wrote to Christians these words. But since you excel in everything, and he gives some examples, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also, so in addition to all this, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So excel in all aspects of life, like work hard at things, but don't forget about the grace of giving. And the word excel here means to be exceptionally good at something. So what does it mean to excel in the grace of giving? How do we become exceptionally good at something that for a lot of us is kind of difficult? How do we live a life of irrational generosity? You know, Jesus once told a story that is very relatable to our lives. In fact, Jesus does this a lot. And um, if you're in church, you'll know this story. If you grew up in church, it's called the Good Samaritan story. You know what it's about. If, if, if you don't know anything about the Bible, I'm sure you've heard a little bit about this story because we even have laws based upon it. And typically, this is a lesson about how to treat people around you. But it's also an analogy Um, of attitudes that exist when it comes to money and stuff. Now, it's recorded by a guy named Luke who actually wrote his book or his document to prove the legitimacy of Jesus. And what happens is someone comes up to Jesus one day and he asks him, Jesus, who's my neighbor? And Jesus responds by saying this parable or this story. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. So it's about an eight-mile trip there. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. 
So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, and, and he names this guy because a Samaritan would have been the guy's enemy. As he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Listen to all the talk about money and stuff here. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? That's Jesus asking. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And I just love how Jesus ends that conversation. He says, go and do likewise, meaning you are currently not doing this, so make this something that you aspire to go after or aspire to do. Now, author and speaker John Maxwell, he gives three attitudes that are expressed in the three different people in the story. And I just love how he phrases this. Um, they are three attitudes that each of us can find ourselves relating to. And the first one is this. What's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. That was the robber's. They felt entitled. They felt like this guy had something they wanted, and they were going to get it no matter how much it hurt. Now, in essence, a word for that is greed. Greed is the attitude that says, okay, I'm not satisfied with what I have. I want more. And it's an attitude that says I'm never content. And it's an attitude that says I'm going to get what I want, however I want, and walk on top of whoever I need to in order to get there. And I'm pretty sure that all of us can figure out that this is an attitude that opposes what God asks from us and calls us to be. The robber said, what, what's mine is yours and I'm going to take it. And I know what you're thinking. Okay, cool. I'm not a thief. I would never take something from anyone. And I say, great. I applaud you for that. But I think a lot of us can have this attitude by just being discontent or coveting something someone else has, like maybe the new Tesla truck, even if it has some broken windows. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the best tweet I saw in it this week was this. Someone tweeted, finally, Elon Musk created the vehicle I drew in grade school. I thought that was just awesome. <laughs> but this, this attitude says, I see something someone has, and I want it. Coveting or envy rots the bones, and it's why Jesus said it this way. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. I heard this story once of an old miser. Now, a miser is basically the opposite of generous. It's a person who's stingy, is a Scrooge-like person. And interesting enough, miser is the root word for miserable. But anyway, there's this miser who... Um, he made it his life's ambition to accumulate as much as he possibly could. And he never gave any of it away. He wanted it all for himself. And he actually left instructions for his wife that when he died, he wanted her to bury him with all his money. He said, I want you to put it in the casket with me because I want to keep it. It's mine. I want to go down with it. And so finally, he did pass away, and some of the family and friends knew about his wishes. And at the funeral, there was an open casket, and they watched as the wife of this miser went with a small box and tucked it in beside him just before they closed the lid. And then she went back and sat down, to which some of the family members walked over to her and said, did you just do what I really think you did? Did you really put all the money he had in the casket with him? And she said, yeah, I sure did. And they were all like, I can't believe you did that. To which she replied, hey, don't worry about it. I wrote him a check. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the point is this. Don't just count yourself out on this attitude because it's probably a lot more of a natural response for us than living a life of irrational generosity. Second attitude expressed in the story Jesus told goes like this. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. Now, these are the two religious people we hear about, the priest and the Levite. And notice, these are people who love God. They are pretty good people. They are religious. They're doing what they should on the days they should. They, they live like they should with this outward appearance that they got everything together. And in a way, it looks like there's nothing wrong with this kind of attitude, right? Like, I worked hard for this. This is my stuff. I'm going to keep it. It's mine. And a word that characterizes this 
is selfishness. It's not I'm going to take what you have, but it does say I'm going to keep what I've got because it's mine. But again, Jesus consistently challenges this attitude. There was another time when a man walked up to him and asked him, hey, Jesus, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that your life needs to be about me, and your whole life is about me giving you things that you are to leverage. And church, I want to say this. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of Hope City because we consistently do this. We do it through our outward bound thinking and giving. It's who we are. We don't just use all that we get for us. It's a mindset that says we're going to do with a little less so that we can do a little more for others and have greater impact. You know, one of our global workers, a couple that we support is uh, Randy and Carla Redman. And they run a children's home in Brazil called Home of the Good Shepherd. And in fact, our youth over the last two summers did some missions trips with them in Brazil. And they were just here in August. And we uh, just had them chat with us and tell us a little bit about some things that are going on there and what they're looking forward to next. And I want you to watch this now. We deal a lot with kids. When we first went out there, there was just boys. And along the 15 years that we have been there, we have now expanded to girls. And we have a boys site and a kilometer away a girls site. In total, there are nine houses. Boys are separate from girls. We have house parents who look after them. We have staff, psychologists, uh, social worker, kitchen staff, office staff, pastoral help. Uh, we are working a lot in, a, in all the different areas, all to help the better enrich the life of the child. 90% of our children have been in some way sexually exploited and 10% of our children have been abandoned or neglected. Hence uh, uh, the name Home of the Good Shepherd. So our kids all come to us through the judicial system and they may stay with us for several months or for many years. So we never know quite how long they're going to be staying with us when they come to us. And once they turn 18, if some of them stay until they're 18 years old, they will maybe have nowhere to go. And so we've set up another program for one year where we get them a very basic little apartment. We try to help them get a job. We help them with their finances to figure out how to get their feet on the underneath them and then we will uh, provide them with a place to live and help them so that they can take a step out to living on their own. When actually the group from Hope City was here and they were sharing at the home about different experiences and was talking about how to love God and love others and when I was giving the girls a ride back to their home and talking about that message, one of the girls had said, yeah, like before I came here two years ago, I didn't know anything. I was so angry at life. I didn't know why God would even allow me to come here. And it was so neat to see how she's saying, how now she's able to love herself. Now she's able to try to love other people. And so what we're super excited about is starting Arasha, which is in English, The Rock, a multi-use facility, which we will have as a church. And then we will also have it as an opportunity to reach out to the community. So we're starting to do that in small home groups already, but running alpha programs and different small groups, uh, programs for the youth that we have at the home and for the community and we're trying to meld that together and so that's something that we're really excited about that we're in the middle of a building project right now trying to get this place up and going. All of us working together is what makes this possible and we just thank you so very much for all of your financial support, for all your prayers. It's huge and we just appreciate it so much so thank you. Thank you so very much. We love those guys. And this is our latest dream for our Hope Fund is to come alongside Randy and Carla and help them with this next, this The Rock building that they're talking about. And we want to raise $100,000 for them. And you know what? I love that this actually coincides with us wanting to build our East expansion that I talked about to you last week. And it's the beauty of this. We're not just focusing in on ourselves. We're saying at the same time that we are needing to build something for us, let's build something that is needed to reach people and kids in Brazil. 
And that sort of seems irrational, doesn't it? And yet the fact is God calls us to this. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So we have attitudes one and two, and the third attitude expressed in the story that Jesus told is this one. It says, what's mine is yours, and I'm going to give it. What's mine is yours, and I'm going to give it. And this was expressed through the actions of the Samaritan. And right away, I get what some of you might be thinking. Okay, if I live this way, it seems like I'm going to have to maybe settle for less. I'm going to have to be a little dissatisfied because I'm constantly giving. Well, the Bible actually says the exact opposite. And the truth is the only way you can experience this is to test it for yourself. And the reality is a lot of you already have time and time again, families, individuals, couples have stepped up and said, we want to sow into God's kingdom. And you have taken a substantial amount that it can, could be used in another way. And you've have sown it into something bigger and greater than yourselves. And we have seen eternal impact because of it. So I commend you for that. Because this is actually one of the greatest gifts that each of us possesses, whether in small or in great measure. Listen to these truths. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. It's kind of like what these words are saying is when you live this way, you don't end up depleted. You don't end up empty. You end up refreshed, meaning new, regenerated, reinvigorated. Living this way changes you completely. But the truth is you can only figure this out if you actually live this out. That's why Jesus himself said, blessed, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so if you're here and you're thinking, okay, cool, I want to I wanna do this. I, I, I want to start pursuing this. I want to give you some practical ways in how you can embrace this in your life, how you can live this out. And it really starts by owning a word that will help define your attitude when it comes to money. And that word is simply this, obedience. You see, at the core of the Christian life, there actually is a, live, a level of giving and generosity that God calls us to. And obedience is saying, I'm going to do what I should do about it. Obedience is baseline generosity, the starting point, And the starting point is actually a really high standard. It's something that the Bible talks about and calls us to. It's something called tithing. It's the principle that says all we have is from God and all we get to enjoy comes from him and through him. And so because of that, he asks us to put him first in our money. And he says, give a tenth back to me. And I get it. Some of you are like, dude, man, that's nuts. And I'm like, yes, it is. It's irrational. But once again, you only understand the value of something like this when you put it into practice. God says it this way. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. God's saying, this is what I want you to do. Test me in this. In other words, see if this works or not. And here's what I know to be true because it's something I've done my entire life. There, yeah, this is a measure of obedience, but the return of understanding the blessing, the fullness, even the looseness that money has on our life with this baseline obedience is something we can't buy. You know, when I was 13, I received my first official paycheck ever. I, I uh, mowed lawns at a camp all summer and they didn't pay me till the end of the summer. And I was 13 years old and I got a check for $1,300. And for a 13 year old, you just think you won 65 mil, if you know what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> and it was awesome. I remember my parents sitting me down and saying, okay, Phil, now you gotta give 130 of this to the church. And I was like, shoot, that could buy me a skateboard, dad. You know what I'm saying? But my parents set in motion a practice that I haven't stopped. And in fact, in our marriage, Marla and I consistently year over year always strive to give more than the last year. And it's been a really cool and fun journey for us. So to grow in generosity, you're going to do what you should do about it. That's obedience. And then I'm going to challenge you to the next level. And that is you're going to do what you could do about it. That's the next level. It goes from obedience to sacrifice. I'm going to do what I could do about it. 
sacrifice. And I want to say this, God demonstrated the ultimate sacrifice by giving Jesus to humanity. He came, he died on a cross so that you and I can have forgiveness and live life to the full. And upon that sacrifice, everything changes for those who embrace it and for those who live it out. In essence, the Jesus life is the ultimate form of blessing we receive from the greatest sacrifice ever made. And so if you're new to understanding faith in Jesus, and maybe you're wanting to take that next step of committing your life to him, at the end here this morning, I'm going to help steer you into embracing this. But in order to live sacrificially, you typically have to give up something. And that, to many people, is irrational. But it was also irrational for God to send his son to die on a cross, and yet three days later, he rose, and it's the greatest event of humanity. Living this way will cost you something. It's kind of like you're going to pick up donuts for the entire team on the way to work. Or it's tipping your server just over the top because you feel they just need it this one time. Or it's just leaning in and helping Randy and Carla so they can help more kids. And this type of living, when you go from obedience to sacrifice, actually becomes super enjoyable. And once again, I say, there are many of you who get this and live this out. And so I commend you for this. It's not what you should do about it. It's what you could do about it. So friends, what could you do that you haven't done yet to bless someone else? Check out what some early Christians did and what Paul, a New Testament writer, applauded. He wrote this, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. So these people, they took generosity to a whole nother level. They went from obedience to sacrifice and the key phrase here is entirely on their own. See, the reality is this is something someone else can't make you do. I can't persuade you in this. No one can force you or coerce you to live an irrational, generous life. This is something you entirely on your own need to embrace, need to live out, need to test and want to go after. So friends, may you live an irrational, generous life. May you mirror the Samaritan and how you approach your stuff and money and say, what's mine is yours and I'm going to give it. May you be obedient in this area in your life. May you discover the joy of sacrifice so that others will benefit. And may you experience the reality that your life will be so much richer by doing this. And I close with these words from Paul. He says, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. So in other words, God provides everything. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. Generosity always impacts us. Generosity always impacts others. And generosity always points people to God. So friends, may you always live a life of irrational generosity. I'm going to ask you to stand, please. I'm going to close in prayer. Stand if you can. Jesus, I thank you for this challenge in our life. I thank you that you call us to something that for a lot of us isn't easy, but it's something that you want us to embrace because it brings blessing into who we are. And so I pray for every individual, wherever they're at, whatever journey they find themselves in, in in regards to their own possessions, stuff, and finances. May you speak into their life. May they start with obedience and say, God, I'm going to move forward in this. I'm going to test you in this. I'm going to try this. I'm going to see what you bring. And Lord, may you bless them and guide them and direct them and speak into their life because of it. I thank you for them. And I thank you for how you direct us and help us through this. You know, maybe you're here and you're saying, you know, I, I, I want a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't know him personally, but today I want to cross that line of faith. And I'm going to pray a prayer. And you can pray that prayer along with me that just says, Jesus, I want you in my life. And I want to live that, that life, that generous life that you give me. And so, Jesus, I'm here today. And I say, come in. Forgive my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross, for raising again, for offering me life and life to the full. And so today I surrender all that I am to you completely and fully. I I ask you to be my Lord and leader and I pray that my life may be aligned with yours through every season, through every circumstance, through every situation. And I thank you that I can begin on this journey and it just resonates so well with me in my heart. 
And so I pray for every individual, for every couple, and for every family represented here, Christ. I pray that as they go into this week, they may sense you with them. I pray that you lead, guide, direct, and steer their path. And may they walk in the obedience of knowing, God, that you are for them and not against them. And may you continue to bless them for their generosity. And I pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed the prayer of committing your life to Christ, maybe for the first time or re rededicated your life, can I just ask you to text the word life to 555-888. We'd love to get a digital booklet in your hand that talks a little bit more about what it means to follow Jesus, to know Jesus. And it also gives you the opportunity of connecting with one of our pastoral staff if you so want to. Also, for anyone here, if you want prayer after the service about anything in your life, we'll have a prayer team down at the front right who would love to connect with you. Friends, know this. You are consistently prayed for. You are loved. And I challenge you to go into this week and live a life of irrational generosity because I know God will bless and honor that in your life. Thanks for being here today. Have an incredible week.